from rags to riches. That's a typical narrative of successes in China. But Pudong's aspiration is much bigger. An ever-evolving miracle of what China's reform and opening up policy could achieve. A hard-earned legend, always striving for the better. Join me from Shanghai for the story of Pudong on his 30th anniversary. Hello, I'm Tian Wei, and welcome to this special edition of World Insight. I'm now in Shanghai telling you the story of Pudong. This is Pudong. The skyline is all too familiar with anyone who knows some about China's reform and opening up. From farm rice paddies into skyscrapers, and from a sleepy backwater to a thriving backbone of Shanghai. Located east of the Huangpu River, Pudong today is a brand new district, created originally in the 1990s to get a new area off the ground. Today, its focus is finance and high technology. If one studies history well, the dream of modern dazzling Pudong started from the era of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, known as the father of modern China. But at the time, China was poor and constantly struggled with civil wars and foreign invasions. So Pudong was not on the agenda until more than decades later, when the People's Republic began its reform and opening up policy. Standing in the middle of Lu Jiazui, the financial magnate of Pudong, I was accompanied by an eyewitness to how it came into being. Chen Jun from Fudan University International School of Finance once worked in the U.S. after graduating from university there. Shanghai is his hometown. He told me about his first trip back home when Pudong was just starting out. So the, that was the very first building in Pudong, right? The Oriental Pearl. Absolutely. So uh, I remember uh, we I came back with my uh, a PhD thesis advisor. Uh -huh. He's British. Uh, we came back in uh, 2002 or 2003. Uh, that was pretty much the only uh, tower uh, in, in Pudong area. Of so course. that was very, very impressive. But it, it looked a little bit strange if you look at the skyline because there wasn't anything else. And then uh, uh, we came back again in 2006. We, we hosted a global financial conference. I see. Uh, right in this building. Okay. Uh, Jingmao Tower. Right. So, so this is one of the tallest <coughs> the three buildings in Pudong, right? Uh, there wasn't. That, that, that's the. I remember this was the tallest building <laughs> at that time. Uh, and then uh, there is Grand Hyatt Hotel up high. Uh, I remember we had a room uh, on the 82nd or 83rd floor. Uh, my friends <coughs> in Shanghai they wanted to visit us in the room. Mm -hmm. I was surprised. I said, Why you want to come to our room? Once they come into our room, <clears throat> they basically said, if I remember, uh, that area uh, had the highest, most expensive residential towers. So they want to come in. <laughs> to check the residential Absolutely. towers. Do they want to buy an apartment? No, because <laughs> was, was, the price was very, very high. They mm. just want to take a look. Mm. So that was 2006. And then, uh, I believe this uh, International Financial Center. Yes. Uh, there was some history behind it. Uh, they started to build this in the late 90s, um, and then you know the Asian financial crisis broke out. Uh, the, the 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 process was suspended for a few years, and it was completed uh, probably around uh, 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. But of course, we know uh, the global financial crisis mm -hmm. broke out in that time. So that was that was the third. Uh, building. Okay, so this one was actually quite a story, isn't it? Exactly. At the very beginning, it was uh, when it was built. It was the Asian financial crisis. That's right. 1997. Exactly. And then, and then after. It's finished. It's exactly. the global, it's the global financial, financial crisis. So I, I remember people even in Shanghai were discussing or debating uh, about the pros and cons of uh, the financial sector, mm. financial services, because. Mm. Uh, when it when it's uh, going well, it helps everybody. But when it's not going well, it, it creates problems. 
But I guess uh, people continued, huh? Uh, no, uh, no, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's right. And then we have this building, uh, the so tallest one. This is, this is the Shanghai Tower. Yeah, the tallest one over there. Uh, I actually talked to the architect, uh -huh. American, who designed the building. Oh, is it? Exactly. And he said, uh, you, as you can see, there's a twist. The building twists. Indeed. Uh, and the, the twist design helps save energy and material. Wow. So it's a totally new concept Absolutely. now. Absolutely. It's not about you know the brightest and the tallest. It's about another different lifestyle. And there's supposed to be a, a very green building as well inside. Amazing. Um, so, Amazing. so that's a, a little history about uh, Pudong uh, with the four buildings yeah. uh, around so, us. So when you, you know, walking around here, you know, just 20 years time, right? Uh, 30 years time, it's already changing so much. Absolutely. And people's way of thinking, mm -hmm. also our interactions with the rest of the world. Right, right. I'm sure there's a lot of uh, interesting reflections and also thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when um, uh, in 1990, when uh, Pudong was first started to, 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 to reform, uh, I was a college student mm -hmm. at Fudan. Uh, I left uh, for the for the U.S. in '92, and again back then there was nothing uh, that wasn't built. Mm -hmm. uh, so so Pudong basically you look over. I don't remember remember any building. Maybe there was a park. Uh, but uh, when I started to come back in the early 2000s, things Different. just changed very changed rapidly. So fast. Uh, that, that that's what I remember. Every year when we when I come back to Shanghai to Pudong, every year. Uh, things change so so dramatically. Uh, the skyline changes very rapidly, uh, but of course now you can see that the skyline is uh, pretty complete. Yes. Uh, I should add that uh, I have now a lot of students mm. uh, working, working in, in all these areas. As you can see, that there are a lot of these bank buildings. Absolutely. Uh, importantly, there are a lot of uh, buildings uh, uh, for foreign institutions. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is where global financial institutions. Are based. Are based. Uh -huh. At least a regional headquarters. This is the place. This is the place. Mm. Uh, so I, I actually have a lot of uh, students. Uh, so it's very different. Uh, back in 2006, I had to find a hotel room in Jingmao. <laughs> uh, now any weekday afternoon, in theory at least, yeah. I can stop by uh, one and of their offices hi. and say hi. Exactly. It's so amazing. It's amazing. So, so in that sense, now <clears throat> really we can say that Shanghai has evolved into a global financial center. Amazing. It's beautiful. Well, Qian was proud to be a witness of Pudong's meteoric rise. That transformation has been drummed up by many throughout the past 100 years. But things did not go smoothly. Take the city jewel, the Shanghai Stock Exchange, for example. It began in the 1920s. By the 1930s, Shanghai had emerged as the financial center of the Far East. But the operation of the exchange came to an abrupt halt after Japanese troops occupied the Shanghai International Settlement during World War II. After that war, the Shanghai Stock Exchange picked up its pieces, went back to operation. But then there was the civil war in China, followed by more political changes and movements in the country. So it was closed and reopened several times. But things did not settle until after China's reform and opening up. In 1990, finally, the Shanghai Stock Exchange was re-established and went into operation. It has also taken on a new flavor, that is high-tech related stocks, with the establishment of the star market believed to be a competitor to the Nasdaq. Though aspiration to develop Pudong was there for some time, how to deliver it after the country was closed to the outside world for so long is another issue. That's what Zhao Qizheng thought about every day. For decades, Zhao enjoys the nickname Pudong Zhao because the Pudong New Area was his sole career from day one when he served as the first governor of Pudong from 1992 to 1997. And his oral story about it is just incomparable. 
For example, he remembered clearly the first challenge he had when working on a plan for Pudong, how to dream big with a concrete future in mind. I heard when Pudong was just starting to develop, you asked your colleague to stand beside a globe to plan for Pudong's future. What do you make of Pudong's future? The goal of Pudong development is to revitalize Shanghai and obtain qualifications for major economic dialogues with the world. Shanghai's location is advantageous. Now we are standing next to the wharf. At the time, we said that there is an economic corridor in the Asia-Pacific region. That is, the economically developed cities can be connected in a line from Tokyo and Osaka in Japan to Seoul, Shanghai, Taipei, Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, China to Singapore. These cities are the street lights in the developed area of East Asia. If foreign investors go ashore in Shanghai, when they turn around, they face the Pacific Ocean. When they stretch their left hands, they see Northeast Asia. When they stretch their right hands, they can reach Southeast Asia. So not only did they go to China, they also went to East Asia, so they think it makes sense to stand next to a globe to think about the development of Pudo because they can operate things in a large area of the world. That's how we understand the saying, and we persuaded foreigners to think the same way. So we have absorbed a large number of foreign investors this way. That saying actually impresses a lot of people at that time. The trend of globalization is still going on, and we must utilize globalization to revitalize Pudong, as well as Shanghai as a whole. But the plan is only a plan until it takes off. For an area with mostly rice paddies, building infrastructure and modern buildings like those behind me so that the big international banks can move in to work became the top priority. Standing in front of the Pudong skyline, Zhao is more than proud of what has been achieved. Lu Jiazui, right behind us. There were a lot of stories, isn't it? Uh, uh. This area was constructed in 30 years. A total of 4.7 million square meters have been completed, and there are approximately 300 office buildings. So this is the main force in Shanghai's financial district, where there are currently about 230,000 financial white-collar workers. When we started to build Shanghai into a financial center, it was a major functional area, so there were so many buildings, and about one-third of the buildings, about 100 buildings, pay 100 million yuan annual tax per building. It is impressive when calculating the tax based on the number of buildings, 100 million yuan per building per year. Of course, Shanghai Tower is my favorite. More than 600 meters, it is 580,000 square meters. And the first one worth mentioning is like a Chinese pagoda, which is 290,000 square meters. I want to emphasize that the old buildings, which everyone likes in Shanghai, are located in the Ban. If you add up all the buildings on the Ban, its floor area is smaller than that of the Jingmao Tower, which is 290,000 square meters. A building occupied more floor areas than a street built before. So there are a lot of stories here. I heard it's a great competition. Every architect wants to have a building here. Of course, foreign architects built many buildings here at first, but Chinese engineers cooperated with them in this kind of construction, so we were able to quickly grasp a lot of new designs. So the later constructions were mainly done by Chinese designers, which also fully reached the world level. You always come here and visit? Of course, I'm so happy. My mood is getting better when I see the buildings here because I know that we can do what we want. A promising Pudong was on the horizon, but how do they let the rest of the world know about it and earn trust? Another challenge for Zhao. His solution? Turning some of the world's biggest names into messengers for Pudong. You are being nicknamed as the Pudong Man, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And uh, you've been trying to talk to as many people as possible, some of the VIPs also. For example, former U.S. Uh, presidents, Clinton, uh, George W. Bush, George Bush, mm -hmm. the family members. And you also try to persuade the Europeans coming over. How, did, how does that work? How did you try to get across all these messages? How is trust being built? 
There was an important China expert, Dr. Henry Alfred Kissinger. He has come more often than others, asked more questions, and has profound insights. He said, when China first announced the development of Pudong, the international community thought it was just a slogan, not really about opening up. But I have come to observe many times. The first time I came, you showed me the plan on the map, and the second time you displayed the model, and the third time I saw the construction crane, so I believe that Pudong development is a practical action, not a slogan. Were you excited when he said that? I was very delighted, and I asked him to say the same thing in the United States and Europe. He said he was willing to do the job. <laughs> Did you thank him later for saying it repeatedly to his friends? I am very grateful to him, and he did attract other high-profile foreign figures. For example, former French President Jacques Chirac. I asked the president to give a speech at the first hotel built in Pudong. He said, this is the place where the sun rises. I am willing to speak here. He added that the Great Wall is magnificent, the canal is splendid, and Pudong is a spectacular. Pudong is also history. I was so happy to hear it because some French investments would be coming to Pudong. <laughs> These are the wonderful things, but there are also worrying moments during the whole process. 1997, Asian financial crisis. 2008, world financial crisis. So the idea of having a financial center, how is it related to risks, how to manage the risks? I'm sure there's a lot of thinking. Uh, we have a basic point of view, that is, it is absolutely necessary for China to have a financial center in order to develop into an economic power or a big country. Financial center is like the heart of the financial circuit. So no matter how difficult it is, we must persist without doubt. Meanwhile, we have always emphasized the credit of China's finances. For example, we have maintained close contact with the United Nations International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. One impression of the World Bank is that when Shanghai borrowed money from the World Bank, it often has a clear goal, a short period of use, good results, and accurate return. There is no ambiguity in terms of returning time and interest. So they are willing to do financial transactions with Shanghai. So talking is only part of the role, and doing is the most important thing. Only by doing what is said can people have a firm confidence in Shanghai becoming a financial center. The other thing I want to ask you, Mr. Zhao, is about how to balance the software and the hardware, they say. So software, it's about policy. When can you get sufficient policies at the right time. The hardware, of course, is infrastructure uh, in Pudong, both the buildings and everything related to it. How do you see the growth of the hardware and software? You're right. One of Pudong's achievements, the solid achievement, is hardware. That's why people see so many buildings, good factories, highways, and modern airports being built within such a short period of time. If the hardware can function normally, it means that we have problems with our software. Now we need to examine the functions of these software at any time. For example, how much cargo does the airport use in a year, and how many people does it use? What is the flow of funds in and out of our bank? Whether there are enough vehicles in our highways and our bridges? So now that this all, are operating at full load, it means that our hardware is not enough and we need to do more. Of course, there are difficulties, that is, our usable land is decreasing. How do we continue to build on the precious land? We need to divide our software into two aspects. On the one hand, when we design these hardware, we must consider what its functions are. We can't build something without the influx of capital and talents. Mm. Uh, there is no such situation in Pudong. We have done extensive research before building things, and we have investigated the potential issues. If people promise to come immediately, we offer them a discount. If they promise to come later, we register for them, so that none of our buildings are empty and none of our buildings are useless after construction. 
As for the policy, the overall policy in China is the same. There is no special preferential policy in Pudong. But here we have high efficiency, complete supply of talents, and comprehensive supply of materials. In this way, this kind of concession is more effective than the fiscal and tax concessions written on paper. From rags to riches, that's a typical narrative of successes in China. But Pudong's aspiration is much bigger. An ever-evolving miracle of what China's reform and opening up policy could achieve. A hard-earned legend, always striving for the better. Join me from Shanghai for the story of Pudong on his 30th anniversary. Pudong was not built in one day, as it aspires to be not only a world-class financial hub, but also front line for innovation. China has been dreaming about innovation for long. In its modern history, Shanghai was a big showcase with construction of the earliest modern manufacturing base, the Jiangnan Shipyard. Established in 1865, then known as the Qiangnan Arsenal, is believed to be the cradle of China's national industry and technology. Its origin lies in the self-strengthening movement of the late 19th century during the Qing Dynasty in China. The movement was known in history as a period of institutional reforms following a series of military defeats and concessions to foreign powers. One of the projects in this campaign of modernization was the advent of the homegrown defense industry. The Qiangnan Arsenal in Shanghai began making firearms and building naval vessels. The Jiangnan Arsenal, later was known as the Jiangnan Shipyard. Its function has also been changing over the decades. Now we walk in Pudong along the Huangpu River. One could hardly find any trace of the shipyard left as it was requisitioned for the 2010 World Expo. Most of the site for the expo is in Pudong. The event that year was about celebrating the world's latest innovation in urbanization. That celebration had never stopped, but only got better with the transformation of Pudong into a heartland for innovation. Today, through robotics, artificial intelligence, etc., and with multinationals taking the lead, supported by local talent. I met Ray Liang at ABD Pudong. The company is building a brand new robot factory which can make up to 100,000 units a year. Okay, I'd like to show you, we call this uh, IRB 1100. Mm -hmm. This is a fast robot and very high accuracy robot in the world for such kind of a small robots. Fastest and the most accurate. Exactly. Wow, take a look. Yeah, that is the future robots, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> okay, then we'd like to show you another very popular one. This is, we call this one Yumi. Mm -hmm. Actually, it means you and me. So it's about we can work together with this robot. It's the first collaborative robot of a unit. So it works with human. Exactly. The reason you have the rubber here is to make it safe, right? Exactly. You can touch it and then you can walk together. Mm. So this is already a very different generation of robots. Uh, yeah. This is a, uh, we are walking more and more in that direction. Mm. If you uh, change it more and more in also in the uh, robotics industries also. Okay. And uh, you got bigger ones to show me? Yeah, of course. This is uh, also I like to show you a very interesting and classic robot here. It's a big robot, right? Uh -huh. Look Absolutely. Here. <laughs> yes. Gigantic. Actually, yeah, it's using a lot in the auto OEM factory for manufacturing the car bodies. Oh. So the application here is a spot welding. It's a uh, fabric the car body. It's a uh, very uh, powerful and using a lot. Okay, certainly it sells very well. Yes, <laughs> of course. You got the other babies to show me? Yeah, 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 let's go. Okay. okay. 
this is our column factories. Look at here. Here is the texting and collaboration stations. Uh -huh. In next year, we are going to build a new mega factories, and this factory will be 100,000 unit output per year. Quite cool, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Obviously, Mr. Liang is really proud of the diversity of robots the company in Pudong sells to global markets. But with innovation becoming the focus of many localities in China, what could be Pudong's niche? Two industrial analysts have their answers. Jeffrey Townsend from Peking University, who is following closely Chinese tech entrepreneurship, and Jay Huang, the former managing director of Intel China, now starting his own company on high-tech investment in China. I think uh, uh, Shenzhen and uh, Pudong can, can be seen as uh, two pioneers and in China. And Shenzhen originally designed for labor intensive and uh, factories and uh, with imported material and then with the labor intensive processing factory assembly, etc., and then exporting to overseas. Uh, that was the original design. Pudong, on the other hand, is designed for multinational corporation R&D centers regional headquarters, etc. Now you look at uh, Shenzhen, it's a much more entrepreneurial and the center uh, of the China. There's a lot of new startups. And then you look back to Pudong, there's a lot of multinational corporations uh, in there. And also like in semiconductor area, uh, the largest foundry, the Chinese foundry, the SMIC, the Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation is also um, in Pudong you can see quite an interesting different um, perspective and also different uh, strengths in, uh, compared to Pudong and Shenzhen. I think uh, both will do well, in my opinion, just with a different emphasis, a different uh, um, maybe uh, developments. Mm. China has been working so much on its plan of semiconductor due to the ever more complicated geopolitics. So how do you see, you know, Pudong uh, in a way could play a role there, even though many Chinese cities are aspire to be there too? Um, also, a good question. Now we know we have this uh, um, starboard and <laughs> setting up. The so look back and before the starboard um, in the past decade. Averagely speaking, every year only one semiconductor company got listed in the main board. With the star, star board and the star market coming to place, uh, we already seen uh, 26 semiconductor companies are listed on the star market. We have even more on the pipeline. And then this is going to stimulate the semiconductor companies and then you know, coming into IPO. For the investors, and we see and this is a, a much better exit for the semiconductor investment. And that's why it attracted so much money into this and, uh, area. Mm. Mr. Towson, your take. The breadth of activity, just as an observer like myself will see, I mean, it, it's pretty amazing how many projects are being created city by city, and certainly Shenzhen and Shanghai, and you know, the, the cities you expect are on that list, but it's, it seems to be everywhere. I mean, it seems to be there's a lot of innovation and entrepreneurial activity, and a lot of it won't work out, but that's the nature of entrepreneurship. And uh, it's, it's as close to a national effort <laughs> that, that I've seen in a long time, not just governments, uh, every tech company is thinking about this. If you're a CEO of any digital company in China or smartphone maker, or smartphone de uh, smart device maker, you have to be thinking about your supply chain for semiconductors now. Mm -hmm. So it is sort of a lot of brain power being put on this one question. Absolutely. You know, at the very beginning of China's reform and opening up, gentlemen, it was very much a uh, bottom-up approach. You know, the grassroots try to test the ways and then the policy makers see the future direction and then they set up a policy so that more will join. But now, uh, to, over the past few years, people have seen, well, maybe policy preferences and advantages is even more important than the other things. So what's going to be the logic of China's reform and opening up? How we can study Pudong and try to figure out that logic will be, would that be policy oriented or will that be uh, bottom up strategy, grassroots innovation that's going to lead the way?
Mr. Huang? I think that we can design, you know, with original intent, with a policy gearing up on that. In the end, we always have unexpected consequences, and which may not necessarily align with our original intent, which may not be a bad thing. And you know, right now, I, I see like a Pudong is really a leading um, test bed for new policies that are coming up. And um, you know, in the end, um, it's a couple of things, and it's very important, the talent. You know where the talents are, and that is very important. We do see in Shanghai and Pudo accumulated a top-notch and R&D talents, and for for China, and then and those are very um, are somewhat difficult to replicate in other tier two and tier three cities. On the other hand, you know tier two, tier three cities have lots of R&D, you know resources there, which is a lot more cost-effective than um, Pudo. So we do see a uh, collaboration of mm. Pudong with the rest of the tier two, tier three cities in China, as an example. Interesting. So you're saying now these days policy important, but collaboration and the layout of the overall picture is probably even more important. Mr. Towson, your take. I think if we look back at some of the sort of larger initiatives that work well, we see things like infrastructure, roads, bridges, airports, and automotive sector, aircraft. Uh, there's a nice mix between sort of large companies and, and sort of state support, government support. It's harder for a lot of these leading edge technologies. There, there aren't the net, you know, throwing, well not throwing, but putting a lot of debt or credit or loans isn't going to have the same effect. You're far more dependent on cultivating talent and giving people room to run and then seeing what works and then supporting as you can. But the, the mechanisms are, are arguably less direct. So I think you're going to see a lot more just broad-based infrastructure support. Mm -hmm. By infrastructure, I mean you know taxes, credit, education, training people, things like that, and then giving them room to run. I think it'll be more surprising we've seen uh, before in more predictable sectors. Fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, both of you. Jay Huang, Jeffrey Towson, really appreciate it. As Pudong aspires to combine its advantages of both its financial strength and high-tech core, new challenges emerged again. How to balance, on the one hand, encouraging innovation through a robust financial industry but also balancing well with security. After returning to Shanghai, Chen Jun teaches in Shanghai to his EMBA students while researching about that subject. So this is the building, and now a star market. So, so this building was finished in 9293. Uh, the, I guess the most famous part was it has uh, the largest, maybe, trading floor in Asia. So they have the massive uh, hall where people wearing uh, different color vests were doing trading. I remember trading. those photos. Exactly. <laughs> but as, as we know, we already moved to uh, mostly electronic online trading. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the star market, yes. a, a lot of the information disclosure is also online. So really, that floor, if you visit it now, I actually visited recently because uh -huh. they also celebrated the exchange, celebrated the 30-year anniversary. Uh, the floor now is basically the only thing, the only function for the floor is that when company uh, hold their IPO ceremony, uh, you can you can uh, have the ceremony in the, the, the room uh, <laughs> in, in the floor. That's, a, that's about it. Actually. Now it's really celebrating the starboard, isn't it? Absolutely. So the starboard was launched in uh, July of last year. So uh, in a little more than one year, there are already 191 or 92 companies wow. listed on starboard. And we know that uh, if you look at if you think if you look at the starboard, the most important industries our tech industries, uh, um, pharmaceutical, biotech yes. industries. So, so that's really the now. So how is this compared to, you know, Hong Kong and also to NASDAQ particularly, and probably also to Japan, because the Japanese board really is willing to bring more companies on their platform. That's right. Uh, so it's very interesting uh, that one of the reasons the Starbucks was launched is to reform, again, reform the IPO process and mechanisms. So the Starboard IPO process is very similar to Hong Kong and very importantly to NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. 
And obviously, one of the reasons that uh, uh, the SSC launched the Starboard, in my view, uh, two steps. The first step is that at least make sure that some of the Chinese tech firms will be listed in China and not going to Hong Kong or NASDAQ. I see. We already see that happening. The next step uh, is that uh, uh, the Starboard also wants to attract global companies. Mm -hmm. So not only the Chinese tech firms, we want to attract tech firm com companies from Japan, from Europe, from Europe and the U.S. to be listed here. Obviously, there's there's going to be more reform needed, mm -hmm. uh, but actually, that's uh, we can see that happening in the next five to right. ten years. It's fascinating. But how do you see the balance? On the one hand, encouraging innovation and fintech. On the other hand, uh, you know, emphasizing on the security of the market. Absolutely. Uh, so 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 it's always important to strike a balance between the two. Uh, especially for these tech firms because they are doing things mm. we haven't seen we haven't yeah. seen anywhere in fact so what so so how to strike the balance is a challenge my, my own sense is that uh, you always need to worry about the security of the stock market but also the security of the financial system uh, if a if a tech company is performing what we call traditional uh, financial services tasks such as trading such as lending there needs to be regulation, that's for sure. The question is, should we regulate these new tech companies performing financial tasks exactly the same way as traditional companies like right. banks, or can we do something different? That's so, the question. So this is really about, you got the hardware, you got the tradition already, but how to update the software in a way, and the regulation, uh, regulations. Very important. The, 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 what we call the software, the infrastructure part, not only is uh, the, the systems, but also the technology, right. the, the, the mindset of how you regulate, that's also very, very important. Fascinating. That fine balance, mixing the financial and high-tech industries, is new to Pudong. So it can somewhat learn from others, such as Shenzhen in China. It's China's first special economic zone. But at the same time, also carry out tough tests on its own. Zhao Qizheng, former governor of Pudong, knows all too well what it means. Another thing I want to ask you is about Shenzhen vis-a-vis mm. -vis Pudong. Mm. Uh, Pudong developed 10 years after Shenzhen came into being. Of course, you could benefit from some of the earlier experiences from Shenzhen, but at the same time, Pudong has managed to walk its own road. Now, we see Shenzhen trying to combine finance with new high tech. And now we see Pudong seem to also trying to do the same thing. So people wonder, how will Pudong be able to lead in what area? In Shenzhen, they initially introduced some Hong Kong-based companies. At the beginning, the production of general products became better and better. Shenzhen was called special economic zones at the time, so they focused on economic development. Pudong has no attribute of terms. It is called a new area. No one said that it's just economic. Pudong new area. Pudong new area. It should be a comprehensive development, and more attention is paid to the development of culture, the development of medical care, and the cultivation of social atmosphere. So Shanghai and Shenzhen are like siblings. Each has its own characteristics, but they are complementary. You have Lu Jiazui, Jin Qiao, Wai Gao Qiao, Zhang Jiang. So you have actually more functions compared to Shenzhen. When Pudong was developed, there was a functional design, then a civil design, and then a configuration design. Then Pudong's four functional zones are Pudong's core tasks, as well as finance and trade, high-tech, modern industry, and a bonded zone. It is actually a prototype of a free trade zone. From rags to riches, that's a typical narrative of successes in China. But Pudong's aspiration is much bigger. An ever-evolving miracle of what China's reform and opening up policy could achieve. A hard-earned legend, always striving for the better. Join me from Shanghai 
for the story of Pudong on its 30th anniversary. Three decades after Pudong debuted as the dazzling new area, the miracle was no surprise. But people also realized Pudong's glitter and glamour has been polished by history thanks to cool minds and enormous hard work. Now its future is inextricably linked to how China would tread its road ahead as the second top economy in the world and as a rising global player. Those who witness up close Pudong's past 30 years see it both as a privilege and a test for Pudong and for China. I really want to know, next step, what can you rely on? The field, the land, the talent, what? Uh, it is a vital issue. Nowadays, people ask us, how do we plan to continue the development of Shanghai? And Shanghai should continue prior to carry and try in the reform. For example, the Science and Technology Innovation Board and the registration-based system were launched here. More importantly, you must play a key role in the construction of the Yangtze River Delta. This is an amazing policy. The Yangtze River Delta is the largest economically developed region in China. It has both land and talent, and many outstanding college students in Shanghai chose to work in the Yangtze River Delta so that Shanghai can contribute more to the development of the Yangtze River Delta. It can be the big brother sharing its talents and experience, and also some of the benefits to the Yangtze River Delta. So now we've started to develop this region and have been moving forward day by day. It will be a big scene, a much larger and more ambitious plan than the Pudong development that year. Please wait and see. With that, we are coming to the end of this World Inside Special, celebrating 30 years of Pudong New Area, on the banks of the Huangpu River, overlooking the skyline of Pudong, and feeling all the vibe and energy for change. May more of it will definitely come this way. Best wishes for Pudong and China, turning a new leaf of history. I'm Tian Wei. Thanks for watching.